Today, the Fuji area will experience something different. In deep silence, the forests seem to be waiting for the monster's charge and the Kilex base of operations here. And the defense force is in position. However, no monsters are in sight. And now, the question is, who will be first? Godzilla, Rodan, or Angulus? Here they come. And they're... Ah! To the right! And down a little bit, just beyond those woods over there! Godzilla! No, it's not. The first is the Kaijusaurus Podcast! Hello, everyone! We are back, we're here, we're doing Destroy All Monsters, and this is going to be quite an episode, I think. It is indeed. So, um, as always, Stephen. As always, this is the podcast in which myself, Stephen Sloss, a lifelong fan of Godzilla and Kaiju films, watches and reviews all 30 films in the Godzilla canon with... Oh, me. Uh, I am Ross Menzies. I um, will be telling you all about this film and what I thought. Yes, you're also a blank slate slash I'm also newbie. a blank slate slash newbie. Although, not that much anymore. Not that much anymore. Yeah. That's the thing. I, 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 I am coming to love these uh, <laughs> strange films. And on that note, let's fire right into this. Yes, Destroy sorry. All Monsters, 1968. After the previous two entries, Eber, a Horror of the Deep and Son of Godzilla, were directed by John Fukuda. Ishiro Honda is back. Yes, he is. Uh, Welcome back. Say, no, um, his classic composer as well. Akira Ifukubi. Yes, Did you get a yes. little a little sense of yeah. his composing style? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, written by Takeshi Komura, not uh-huh. Shinichi Sekizawa. Komura's screenplays were a little bit more rough, a little bit uh, grittier, slightly, you know, like mm-hmm. a little bit darker. Uh, and that's evidenced here in Destroying Monsters a little bit. And Tomoyuki Tanaka is back producing it as always but Ross here's a new thing we have to do tell me this is our first goodbye is for this the series. oh no yeah. who are we saying goodbye to we say goodbye to special effects maestro Eiji Tsuburaya goodbye special <laughs> effects maestro Eiji Tsuburaya up to this point his health was rapidly declining uh-huh. and as I said to you in the last few films he was more special effects supervising yeah. rather than actually directing and that's the same case in this film he only supervised didn't fully direct and this is the last Godzilla film he worked on well there we go he died the next year oh really that's a real shame mm. but I mean before I, I spoil what I'm going to say about this film to be honest what, what, a, what, yeah. a, what a film to finish out on like that's something to be proud of no I could not agree more even if he did just Supervise. Yeah, I mean, it's, or, it's, you know, his team. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it was a heck of a spectacle to it supervise really as your last hurrah. So, and indeed, well, speaking of last hurrahs, I mentioned to you on the end of the last episode that this was indeed intended to be the last hurrah well, for Godzilla. I forgot that we talked about that, yeah. but I mean, the entire time I was watching it, I was like, yeah, this feels like the finale yeah. if there ever was one. It does. <laughs> but before we get into that, we'll just do a quick plot synopsis. Yeah, totally. The year is 1999. The far off future year of 1999. Yes. And monsters have been collected in a research facility called Monsterland. They've been corralled there, they're being contained and researched. Everything seems quite harmonious. There's daily trips to the moon leaving via mm-hmm. rockets. Until one day, the Kilax invade and disrupt operations at Monsterland, set the monsters free, and use them under their own control to hold the world at ransom, essentially. Uh huh. And it's up to a plucky team of rocket goers, rocket astronaut rocket, types, rocket men, and some scientists, and some scientists, uh, some military guy, and the military, well, all, all the qualified the UNSC, official. the yeah. UNSC. There we go to put this to an end and destroy all, all monsters. monsters. Asterix, they don't destroy them all. They don't. <laughs> well, well, only maybe King Ghidorah gets yeah, a hard that's time. True. But um, yeah, so. Shall I just dive right in? Shall we start talking about this film? I'll ask it. Ask me the question. What did you think of this film, Ross? Well, here we go. So normally we um, we talked a little bit about this. Normally we we tend to go on doing play by play with the film, sort of going through the motions of the plot. But we decided this time we're going to just test out a briefer synopsis, especially with a film like this, because it's not yeah. so dependent on the broad steps of the plot. I really like this film a lot, <laughs> but I liked it in a different way because normally I respond more to the the, the character driven films, mm. and what this film was not was particularly character driven. Agreed. Yeah, we it's have, driven by huge plot. Yeah, it's driven by the, the big motions of the plot, and really by um, the decisions of UNSC as yeah. opposed to our captain or uh, Kyoko. Mm. Um, but yeah, no. To dive right in, I felt like this movie just had. So so much 
interesting stuff in it. And really, the main, my main takeaway from it was this being a film made in what 1968. 68, yeah. It's just this is a Cold War movie. Yeah, like, that's the vibe that I get. This is a movie about war. It's a movie about um, the military. Mm. It's a movie about being a global like it's a movie about the world like how our countries interact mm. with each other um, so I feel like I have like a lot of weird and interesting little things to say <laughs> about that um, but yeah no so just going from the start like we get our um, our, our 20th century yeah like we're, we're nearing the end of the 20th century etc. In, in, in the international dub which I grew up with like, as usual uh-huh. two dubs by this stage and yeah. two English dubs I grew up with an international one anyway yeah, the year is 1999 mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah no and we get a sight of essentially what the US the USNC's um, military might Mm. We get rockets, we get radars, I believe. We get uh, a sense of just this, of, like how far our yeah. technology has come in the year 1999. And then after the opening credits, we get blasted with the spectacle that is Monsterland. Yeah, Monsterland's wonderful. And obviously, like, um, you watch that and you go, oh, well, guess where they got the idea for Jurassic Park? <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, Monsterland. I really love as a concept I think also what I appreciate is that this being essentially as you said a finale of hmm. sorts it yeah, does well, feel well, obviously it wasn't but we'll just yeah, it, as, not it, being it, it. it was obviously produced as a finale uh-huh. and that was more than evident shows, in yeah. the final product and I appreciate how much it brings together the continuity of the films like not necessarily in like returning characters or anything like that but it just feels like this is the culmination mm. of what's been well when was the first Godzilla film 54, 1954. Mm. this has been 14 15 years yeah. of continual Godzilla attacks in Japan this is what's happened well I mean within the context of the film like, yeah it's 45 you know, years yeah, 45 within years. the context like, of the story yeah. I really respond to the Godzilla films that show us how kaiju monsters affect like politics how it affects yeah. like the culture of people living and, and, there and this is I guess the ultimate example of that yeah it's become this is our like safe place and the first thought I had when we see monster land and we see that um, a lot of our monsters are sort of rounded up and living in this little jungle I'm not particularly sad to see like a you know like a Godzilla under capture or anything like yeah, that yeah. but the thing that like struck like a, a weird note with me was to see Mothra there I actually agree yeah because I just thought in the back of my mind and this is what I like about it is because it's set in 1999 there's a vague sense of dystopia about the world that we have yeah as far as the relate like the relationship to the monsters and it's not really it's not real this is more something I felt but I look at Mothra in this cage and go so what happened to Infant Island? Yeah, what happened to Infant what Island? Sort what sort of happened? colonial horror happened yeah. to these people? What happened to the Shobijin? Yeah. Because uh, well, the whole point of Mothra as a character is don't try and contain nature. Yeah, so what did they do? I actually agree with you because it's been a point of contention in the sort of fandom for a little while that mm-hmm. people find it slightly controversial in this film that Godzilla is susceptible to mind control. Uh-huh. And... I have thought that in the past but in my last couple of viewings of this film and again as always God knows how many times I've seen this film Mm -hmm. but what I've felt recently is completely in accordance with what you've just said like Godzilla under mind control is fine we've seen it in Invasion of Astro Monster before yeah exactly but it's upsetting to see Mothra under mind control because Mothra always had that that, that we've talked about it the deity the sense of like like of being of a higher understanding yeah, than she, us. She's not quite of this plane of existence, yeah, or so. or shouldn't really exist. And not that any of these monsters should really exist, but you get what I mean when yeah, I talk no, about totally. Mothra in that way. And it's like my only thing is like maybe it would have been more interesting if Mothra was the only one that wasn't susceptible, and Mothra was somehow like sort of hiding out somewhere, yeah. or like she returned to Infant Island and like. I don't know. Or was like the organized, card, or, organized a strike force of yes, other monsters. Mothra's team. <laughs> but yeah, no. So it, it, no, I wasn't disappointed to see Mothra sort of just being. I understand why they yeah. just sort of use Mothra as one of the greater team of monsters. But, but it's upsetting. To yeah, see, yeah, but and within the context of the story, I can sort of just allow that to be an element. That yeah, I think yeah, about yeah. like what happened to Infant Island well, in the last thirty and years. What I appreciate about the story is that they don't spend ages. Uh, setting up exposition about Monsterland no. or how it was set up we don't need to or, know like, we, we get, understand there's yeah, a base on we it get, we, get, we get a little bit of narration like, 
boom but it just exists uh -huh. we don't need to know when this was constructed really why it was constructed how it was constructed like how they how they managed to corral these monsters yeah how did into they do this it? island <laughs> we don't really need to know like all all that the story requires is that it starts with these monsters all being uh, contained in this island and then and we don't need to know why or how or until something goes wrong exactly yeah the the base is gassed the scientists are scrambled but yeah. we don't know and it, I, I appreciate it it's what you, you said last time about Son of Godzilla shorthand yeah like we, we get to the points we need to get to quickly yeah no totally like we don't need to meet the scientists that involved that created Monsterland because yeah. that would be Jurassic Park then <laughs> <laughs> yeah well exactly um, yeah so Destroy All Monsters prequel based around Jurassic Park I mean totally like, I'd watch that I if ever if you told me turned around and told me that they were you know the, the monster land concept would return I would be very very pleased uh, oh Steven's smiling <laughs> As I, you're going to be pleased I'm going to be pleased that's very good but now I'm just thinking about a Jurassic Park-esque prequel for Destroy All Monsters well if it takes place like five years before Destroy All Monsters and like an exceptionally old Professor Yamani from the original Godzilla yes. is sort of the John Hammond figure yes 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 <laughs> totally <laughs> Um, our astronauts who can travel freely to and fro from the moon who have been noticing some weird stuff on the moon they return to the base um, at Monsterland which at has Monsterland. been attacked to search for survivors to discover what's going on yes, and indeed. that's where they discover they discover that the monsters are actually not free they're no. still under control mm -hmm. just by a different party yes exactly the Kilax. and it is the character played by Yoshio Tsuchiya uh, Dr. Otani who we have seen a few times before. Uh huh. Um, head of the Exilians. That's right. In Invasion of Astro Monster, mm -hmm. and he was a fighter pilot in Godzilla Raids again. Um, and he he's he was he was the one in uh, Son of Godzilla who when he was a scientist who goes kind of stir crazy. That's right. And, like, he goes a bit manic. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, Doctor Otani and uh, 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 God, what's her goddamn name? Kyoko. Kyoko. Kyoko Yamane. Yeah. and Kyoko yeah Kyoko I knew it was that um, um, are now under control of the Kilax as it's eventually revealed revealed um, and the Kilax are using uh, different monsters to attack different cities Godzilla's in New York Mothra is in Beijing or mm -hmm. actually Peking as it was at the time oh yeah totally you can still hear it in the dialogue even oh, really? though the subtitle it as Beijing um, Rodan is in Moscow Moscow, as Moscow. they pronounce it, yeah, Mos Moscow. On a brief tangent, at one point, um, you get a brief news clip that tells you that Rodan is over the Ural Mountains, and I've I felt proud because I only know where Ural is because of the board game Risk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so um, and uh, well, the dialogue tells us that Baragon is in Paris, uh -huh. destroying the Arc de Triomphe. <laughs> but uh, in the dub, you were well, saying, well, 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 well. Oh. Here's an example of incorrect dialogue in both versions of the film. Let's rewind a little bit back. Uh, early 60s, Eiji Tsuburaya... This is going to be a bit of a, a, bit of a lengthy history. But, I love a lengthy but history. I assure you it's interesting. Cool. Eiji Tsuburaya uh, doesn't part ways with Toho, but splits his time between Toho and his own company, Tsuburaya Productions. Right. Uh, so he's kind of splitting time between both of those. Over at Tsuburaya Productions, he makes a program called Ultra Q. Uh -huh. It's sort of like a... A sort of Twilight Zone, Outer Limits kind of deal cross with Toho Giant Monster movies. Like, 20, 26 episodes, I believe, half an hour long, black and white, and they're sort of like half an hour Toho sci-fi films. Right, okay, that's cool. And it's fucking great. Yeah. Um, but because of his good relations with Toho, he was loaned a lot of Toho's monster suits Sounds for use in his TV good. show, and he would alter them a lot. And, yeah. Uh, okay, the monster Baragon first appeared in a 1965 film Frankenstein vs. Baragon mm. or Frankenstein Conquers the World starring our good pal Nick Adams that's right um, Toho loaned Subaraya the Baragon suit and Baragon became several monsters throughout Ultra Q and its sequel series Ultraman sound <laughs> it all ties together Baragon became several monsters like changing parts of the suit yeah. changing the head adding stuff etc by the time Toho got the suit back it was in pretty bad shape mm. so while Baragon was meant to attack Paris as is evidenced in the final dialogue in both the dub and Japanese versions of the film the monster that attacks Paris in the final version is in fact Gorothorus mm -hmm. who doesn't have a burrowing ability no <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's just sort of he's just a dinosaur yeah, he's, a, he's a giant dinosaur and just 
rips out of the ground. Gorosaurus. He was maybe in the sewers. Maybe he was in the parish crypts. <laughs> uh, the catacombs. The catacombs. Gorosaurus first appeared. Because he'll be new to you as well. Yeah, no, Baragon, there was a few monsters new to me. Yeah. Baragon did appear, by the way. Uh, Baragon appeared at the, the ending montage over Monster Island. Yes. It was sort of the, the quadruped dinosaur with the sort of ears and the horn. And yeah, like when the we're sort getting showing, showing everyone safe and yep. sound back exactly, home yep. on Monster Island. Uh, Gorosaurus, who's new to you as well, uh-huh. first appeared in the previous year, 67, in a film called King Kong Escapes, or King Kongo no Gyakushu. Mm-hmm where he fights King Kong and it's sort of an homage to the fight in the original King Kong with Kong fighting the Allosaurus uh-huh. and it's really good and Gorosaurus is a great fucking suit yeah Manda the sort of sea serpent the man- monster yeah. Manda first appeared in the 1963 film Atragon about a giant imperialist World War 2 secret, super secret flying Japanese submarine wow with a huge drill at the front uh, called the Gotengo right um, which is humanity's last hope in a fight against uh, the undersea dwellers of the continent of Mu slash Atlantis sound the Atlanteans or Mu people invade the surface world and only a sort of disgraced uh, World War 2 Japanese admiral and his super secret weapon the Gotengo <laughs> can save Japan uh-huh. and so he takes the fight to them and Manda is sort of their guardian deity their mm-hmm. guardian monster and guardian, and Manda wraps itself around the sub and sort of constricts it and it's That's great cool. That's really um, cool. and the last monster you haven't seen before is Varen right which Varen one was, was not Varen? In, Varen's not in dialogue right is it on Varen. one of the screens no Varen appears fleetingly twice Varen first descends the first time you see Varen in this film is that he descends during the battle at Monst- at, at the foot of Mount Fuji, he just sort of descends. And goes, yeah, it, it looks like just like a person it's just like dropping like, down, like very sort of like a flying squirrel. Yeah, I remember. And I, I assumed that was someone else. <laughs> and Varen also appears in the closing montage of yeah. a monster island. He sort of flies up, like <laughs> just like, uh, and he's sort of got um got webbed wings. That's like, right. From, from his yeah, from his arms to I his legs. Kind of recognise what you're talking about. Varen first appeared in the 1958. Film Varen the Unbelievable or uh, Giant Monster Varen. Uh-huh. Uh Again, all of these monsters first appeared in independently produced Toho monster films that, that were separate from the Godzilla series, but they were sort of stabled into Destroyer Monsters. Yeah, totally. Just because, I mean, again, there's that sense of finale. You may as well just bring all the other costumes exactly, and yeah. all the other monsters. And that's what I mean. King Ghidorah is back. King Ghidorah's my back. beloved Manila is back. <laughs> I, mean, I am. I am. I was so pleased to see. I was actually. I came to a weird feeling that for much of the film when Godzilla was out was was without Manila, um, I felt like a bit sad. Mm. I felt like seeing at the very end Godzilla and Manila together again made me feel complete and made me feel whole. See, I would say maybe the Kilax were holding Manila hostage to make Godzilla do their bidding, but I don't think he'd give a shit. Yeah, I don't think he'd care. <laughs> there is no evidence to make us think he would care that much. Um, no, he... So yeah, there's there's all the monsters. But yeah, no, so the, the, this is probably a good opportunity to talk very briefly about special yeah. effects. And just briefly... And that's why Gorosaurus attacks Paris Fantastic. when it was meant to be Baragon. <laughs> well, it was a good tangent, because yeah, let's talk about special effects, costume, as well as just... Okay, yeah, everything in it. Okay, first of all, a new Godzilla suit. Great. Tell you this. This is my favourite Godzilla suit. Totally. This, this is probably my favourite Godzilla suit. Yeah, I think yeah, it looks great. It but... looks so much better, so much more lifelike. Yeah. Reactions are good. You know, you can actually tell, like, there's a sense of emotion to yeah. like, what Godzilla's doing. Like, there's reactions. It's not it's just this weird, stony, chubby yeah, yeah. face. Yeah, he seems driven. Like, uh huh. He, yeah. Despite being under control for a lot of this film, he actually sort of has agency in this film yeah yeah, or at least at the end yeah um, uh, King Ghidorah's back the same suit is being reused for the third time it gets he's, a bit bloody he's starting to look a little bit moth-eaten mm-hmm. yeah. he's looking a not bit not that it really matters, matters because he gets battered yeah he gets absolutely gang beaten <laughs> First, it's kind of, the battle starts kind of like you know, yeah, the Earth monsters. Then it goes, stop, <laughs> stop killing Ghidorah. He's already dead. It's so upsetting. Um, we'll talk about that later. That's though. fine. Um, Gorosaurus looks great. Gorosaurus is a great yeah. suit. Like, and that kangaroo kick he gives to King Ghidorah's back, then 
No, totally. All the monster suits look absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And just beyond that, the the rockets, the tanks, oh, God, yeah. the gunfire. I thought the gunfire looked great. Well, what about that that sequence where Godzilla, Rodan, Manda and Mothra are rampaging in Tokyo oh, all at once? Fantastic. Like, that's just an absolute mess. Yeah, and it's it is. so visually engaging. You just feel that stress like that it's, it's completely intensity of the battle an assault on all your senses yeah totally and my probably favourite shot of the film was one that echoed back to the original Godzilla and it was that really stark shot of a destroyed Tokyo yeah we're sort of panning along mm-hmm. uh, to we, the left of just a decimated Tokyo yeah yeah exactly and I can't remember if the shot in the first one was a pan but it might have actually yeah, been it is, quite yeah. similar but yeah but it, now we're in full colour it's a it, very similar shot yeah, yeah. and I, I, I Probably a deliberate yeah, exactly. callback, but I like it a lot. And because it was, this is the first time in a long time that we've really had like the destruction of a city. You know, our last two mm. or three have kind of been on islands and yeah. away from, and we see the cost of that. Yeah, absolutely. We go back well because all of that ties back into what I was kind of feeling earlier about of the Cold War and mm. the, the 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 social element of this film. Like I have. So so much to say just about um, how this affects Japan and how yeah. the, it, within the context of the film because the first thing I'll say is that when um, the monsters under the mind control of the uh, the Kilax mm. start attacking the other countries you get this sense that they're looking back to Japan as a world leader yeah. and in the, our year in this 1999 Japan is a, a very much a superpower yeah, very yeah, much definitely at the world's table and very much um, sort of considered the expert on the kaiju yeah, yeah. just seeing as how much they've had to deal with them mm. and how unique to Japan what the problem achieved. yeah, yeah exactly with what they, yeah with Monsterland um, so I think that, that's just a really interesting idea no I um, agree. you mentioned your favourite shot I was just going to mention oh yeah no actually, totally because, um, my favourite shot or one of my favourite shots like, as, as one of our submissions as we'll read out later says mm-hmm. and as I I've picked up previously and in this viewing especially this is a really well shot film it really is But so I have a lot of favourite shots but one of my favourites is the Manda is constricting itself round a sort of uh, elevated rail railway lines uh-huh. and uh, you just see Godzilla in the background in the middle of a refinery and there's mm-hmm. explosions and yeah and then there's sort of Manda is just wrapping itself around and it slowly collapses off and it. just crushing yeah, the train it's great yeah. and like Manda's great I, Manda's so good and the, the variety of the monsters in this film like no yeah Godzilla and Gorosaurus both kind of look like uh, bipedal dinosaurs but they don't look similar they don't look similar at all all the monsters in this film look so goddamn different no absolutely like there's a great variety and the, well, what I was thinking as well is that with that variety of monsters it means that you get a huge variety of um, monster fights and the, oh, the, yeah. the way that they destroy and the way that they fight are so different to one another that you you know you've got Rodan attacking from above and yeah. lifting people up. You've got uh, or sorry King Ghidorah lifting uh, yeah, yeah. the Angus. A- Angus, yeah. Um, Angus is back. Angus is back. <laughs> Welcome back, Angus. Um, yeah, and you've got the constriction. You've got Godzilla's classic a lot of kicking, yeah. kneeing, punching and sometimes. Breath, yeah. um, totally. So yeah, you just get a huge variety, especially and, uh, in the Tokyo scene. M- Mothra and Kumonga. Kumonga's back, <laughs> just sort of <laughs> spinning, web. spinning their silky webs. Uh, but you mentioned earlier. What, sorry, did I cut no, you? No, no, no. You, you, you were mentioning earlier that you, you sort of got a sense of this being a global film, uh-huh. and this sort of, especially being a sort of in, produced in a Cold War period. Yeah, this isn't. This will be interesting to you uh-huh. then. Uh, the Kilax make Godzilla destroy New York, mm-hmm. and um, Ishiro Honda was historically a director who had faith in mankind and had who had a staunch belief in the United Nations as an yeah, institution in particular. Absolutely. In particular, he really believed in the UN and its mission. Um, and he believed in coalitions and unions between countries and governments and that sort of thing. He yeah. really, really held a sort of staunch, good-natured belief in that sort of thing. But um, by this point in his career and in his life, you know, the Cold War is dragging on and on and mm-hmm. uh, superpower versus superpower with threat constantly hanging over people's heads still in 1968. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to note that when Godzilla makes landing in New York, the building he destroys is the UN building. Really? There you go. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, no, because what I want to say is that 
Yes, the, the Kelax wage war on uh, Earth via their monsters, mm. but there is just this other layer of warfare and beyond that there is like an element of just cold warfare through the surveillance first of all the reveal that the Kelax have been um, monitoring and controlling the, mm. the controlling the monsters through s- concealed radios yeah, yeah, yeah. all over the world just hiding in plain yeah, sight yeah this sense of secrecy yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And surveillance methods that um, when Kyoko comes to um, take uh, the captain and the doctor away yeah. after um, Doctor Odin, yeah, yeah, Doctor yeah. Otani, yeah. Oh, Dr. Otani, uh, yeah. During the shoot, one of the shootouts on the beach, yeah. Um, these guys are dressed in black suits, yeah. And it's just this, the you know, the, the sense of like secret guns, the secret <gasps> service, the secret police. Um, that Kyoko is like a sleeper agent. You know, they yeah. they walk among us. Um, she manages to evade the guards who are looking for her because yeah. they don't notice the earrings. Um, the earrings, that's grisly, isn't it? Yeah, I know. That's oh, oh, yeah, no, totally. And the, 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 the ripping them out. I, well, you know, at first I'm like, oh, well, of course she's got the earrings. You mm. must rip out her earrings to save her, yeah. shouldn't you? But um, since this is. I, I did want to bring this up, but uh-huh. since it's come up naturally, there's. I'll, I'll just bring it up now. I'm going to read to you a paragraph from David Callot's book, okay. uh, A Critical History and Filmography of Toho's Godzilla series, mm-hmm. on Destroy All Monsters and in the earring scene in particular. Cool. Okay. Okay, this is Callot's words from here on. The only human woman in Destroy All Monsters is the hero's girlfriend, and once she is freed from alien mind control, she simply sits around politely and keeps her mouth shut. She is only released from Kilak dominance when Katsuo physically rips the control spheres from Kyoto's bleeding ears. Through violence, the man regains control of the woman, silencing her and removing her individuality. Katsuo realises that only under the influence of the other does Kyoko exhibit such assertiveness and it is his duty to free her from that alien influence so that she can return to her quote-unquote natural role as a submissive female. Totally, that's very interesting and that's sort of along the lines of how I felt watching that scene. I mean, first of all, it's really cool uh, and it's pretty, like... Aggressive, just yeah. rip it, you know. And um, there's it's, a lot of blood in this film. There is, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I agree that it, it's just like, of course, she's. It's, it's the earrings, yeah. the it's, mind control earrings. It's a nasty scene, though. Yeah, like, it's I, I kind know of. He's, it's like a, there's like a sour note to it. I, no, I agree. Like, he is freeing her from alien mind control, but right. he does it in such a violent and sort of uh, sudden. Yeah, and, and, and he, he seems so forceful and hateful, like. Oh, it's, it's a little bit uncomfortable because, yeah, totally. like, the older I get, obviously, when I was a kid, I didn't really think twice yeah, about the scene. It's like, oh, yeah. the hero's saving Whoa. her, <laughs> yeah. But like, even just like hold her back and take them out gently. Yeah. You don't have to fucking <laughs> rip them out. Gap. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's the fact that um, Jun Tazaki's character, the Doctor, holds everyone else back from intervening. It's like, no, no. just like sedate her or I something, know, totally. or just. It's a really uncomfortable scene, and it's it is a sour note, as you yeah, say. It's, totally. it's, just, it's so violent, and it's, oh, it's, it's just weird. It's a tad uncomfortable. Don't rip out people's earrings. I know <laughs> people have had that done to them. It's not fun. Oh god, really? <laughs> yeah, a club once. Oh jeez. Yeah. Were well, they under key like mind control? Yeah, totally, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, I think Callot's like it's it's funny. He doesn't. He just states that as a matter of fact. He doesn't really offer any sort of further opinion. No, on that, I mean, but uh, I agree with him. Yeah. At the it's, end of the day, I guess is I guess that's an interpretation, but yeah. I mean, it's there. It's hard to argue with it. Yeah. yeah. The only thing I would take, I would take um, issue with is that through violence, the man regains control of the woman, silencing her and removing her individuality. Being under Kilak mind control removed her individuality. It's, yeah, exactly. If anything, it's an interesting contrast. He, he's restoring her individuality, but it, it, but he, the thing Kalis, is, is that Kyoko as a character. She's at her most interesting within the film. Exactly. And like most, she talks, she makes arguments, she debates, she uh, she shoots a gun if I'm right. Yeah, and yeah. She like she's in control of the situation. She has guns. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No. So there's a contrast. But when there, she certainly. yeah, when she's human again, she, she has no impact on the plot and whatsoever. And yeah. <laughs> Which is a shame. Yeah. Totally. Uh, um. Especially since in in the past there has been some really great female characters in Godzilla oh, films, no, like like Miss Nimikawa in Invasion of Astro Monster and Dio in Ebra Horror of the Deep. Yeah. But going back to um, what's their names, the uh, 
the Kilak and the their Kilaks. their general things. I just appreciated. They look like a synth band. They do look like a synth band. <laughs> um, I would certainly listen to them. But no, I just appreciate like how much they are trying to like deceive the earth and mm. how many different tactics they're trying to use because it's revealed even that the universal attack on all different cities out around the world was merely a distraction yeah, yeah. so that they could set up a base under uh, Tokyo or under Japan under uh, um, Mount Iso yeah. or near, in the Fuji volcanic region yeah, yeah. absolutely and, and consolidate their power there yeah. get a foothold on earth and begin essentially their colonisation yeah and then uh, launch a massive annihilation of Tokyo no absolutely yeah. Um which leads us to the military mobilisation mm. towards um, Aizu and that's um, tanks coming in and I really like that shot and scene in particular there's a shot where it's um, just over a helicopter mm. as it flies across a uh, sort of valley and we see tanks oh, and yeah. soldiers all heading towards it and that's really when um, all our monsters appear mm. one by one that, that's a great sequence when they're trying to converge on the Keylak base yeah, oh well I mean that's a little oh, bit uh, I'm that's a little bit uh, later on in the film no no no, no, no I, I, I do mean the one you mean like, oh right when it's a nighttime scene yes yeah. and uh and the sort of the moonlight SY3 the moon rocket is, mm -hmm. which is great as well yeah, is just are. sort of hovering over and then Godzilla is just sort of suddenly there uh -huh. like he comes out of practically nowhere he's just mm -hmm. he's guard dogging yeah absolutely the, the, the Kilax. then Godzilla's there then um, Angerus comes out and then suddenly they're being pursued by Rodan yeah like, and that, that, I think I saw you scribble something down immediately after that but well yeah no because that was going back to um the differences the different fight styles you get with different kaiju in yeah. that particular you have Rodan versus the rocket which is like yeah. an aerial dog fight yeah, yeah. trying to just outsmart each other and then th a group of soldiers essentially happen upon Godzilla in, in, the, in the, the, the forest yeah, yeah. and that's such an immediate scene Godzilla is right there above them and these soldiers have no choice but to run yeah. flee scatter so they just scarper and it really just shows you again just number one scale which I always love I always oh, yeah, love totally. the Godzilla scale shot and the monsters are well shot in this film yeah film, totally you know, to give but, um, but yeah no diff completely different ways of using the monsters on screen which I think are really good no I agree definitely um, what else am I talking about well after a while um, the captain and his team head off to the moon base mm. they discover that um, they can destroy the radar yes so they manage to destroy the radar at first they believe they're sacrificing themselves but yeah. they do manage to escape that's a great scene by the um, way when they it, it really the, is uh, the, 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 the control sphere this, and if it could be sort of shrieking sort of violin music the oh it's so good I want to talk very briefly about the captain and his crew because I think it's fun because uh, in Son of Godzilla we had a similar thing we had a captain and a group of um, you know and his crew yeah. essentially well the captain in this film uh, Katsuo is uh -huh. Akira Kubo who was reporter Goro Maki yeah no absolutely in the I certainly previous recognised film, yeah. him I, I, he's really great Good. he's really very great in this because as I say it's not a character driven film mm. but which isn't to say that oh it's a shallow character or anything like that it's yeah, just yeah. literally the character is there to do his job yeah. and does his job and we don't get many, particularly many glimpses into his thought process or his um, his personal yeah, life yeah we see no one's personal life yeah well. we don't need to but there's bigger things yeah, going exactly. on within the context of this film and it's great but Katsuo uh, Akira Kubo as Katsuo gives a really sort of driven intense performance yeah absolutely like he's he just totally the right one like for he's the... constantly angry yeah <laughs> but I appreciate it because last film we had a, a film with a squad but they were on this island there was mm. there was desertion there was mutiny there was squabble among the ranks what I appreciate with um, the sort of yellow uniformed um, squad is essentially they're just like the most well-oiled team. There's no dissent. <laughs> they all follow their captain's orders. Half of them yeah. don't speak. They just stand around and do what they're told and they all look amazing. Yeah, like, they have, like really only two of them talk. Yeah. Like... Squad goals. <laughs> squad goals. <laughs> um, yeah, so returning to Earth exuberant that we have at least stopped control over the monsters mm. uh, Earth decides uh, that they will sort of reverse engineer the technology mm. and control the monsters themselves and that's when the monsters all converge at the foot of Mount Fuji mm -hmm. to attack the ready Kilak to take base. the base and defend against King Ghidorah yeah that's when the uh, the Kilaks pull their trump card and the 
Yeah, and bring out Big Just King G. It was good to wheel see him out. Again. Yeah. Um, so let's now talk about that fight. Obviously, we were saying there that the 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 effects have been great. Yeah. The um, different styles of action that we have with our monsters has been great. So King Ghidorah comes in, and we just get a a mess. It's not a one on one. It's like a nine on one. You have come on. You have you have mo- there's too okay, many monsters the, there. The monsters in this film are Godzilla, Minilla, Anguirus, Mothra, Baragon, Gorosaurus, Varen. Shit, did I say Manda? No, you didn't. Manda, Kumonga. King Ghidorah and Rodan. Rodan. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, 10 or 11 at least. Yeah, uh, yeah and... and. They're not even all there during the fight with exactly. King, Do- King Ghidorah, and there's still too many. Well, <laughs> all the monsters converge. Right, the base at that time, Fuji, but, not, but all... not all of them participate. Yeah. Varen, Baragon, and Manda just sort of sit back and eat popcorn. Mm-hmm. Manila stumbles around like a wee silly. Yeah, it's it's really Godzilla, Gorosaurus, and Anguirus that do most of the damage. Yeah, Rodan and Minya participate get a few blows in and Kumonga and Mothra at the end spray confetti yeah, when yeah, they win yeah. um, <laughs> we but, helped they're the cheerleaders <laughs> yeah they're the cheerleaders <laughs> but yeah no, we were we were laughing or at least I was laughing during this just because it's like it goes from it, as Stephen says it goes from like a yay monster team up and the shot of Godzilla like leading the team yeah, yeah. is fantastic yeah, and so it just good. gets your heart going and you are just like yes but that exuberance does sort of like die <laughs> down a bit when they just keep going they just batter and batter and batter poor King Ghidorah yeah, it gets to the stage where they're just desecrating the corpse they're yeah just... <laughs> at one point Godzilla lays out King Ghidorah's neck and like curb stomps it like slams it against a rock and just bashes it and there's a scene where one of Ghidorah's sort of flailing heads just sort of winds its way up Godzilla's leg as if to say have mercy <laughs> please and Godzilla just grabs it and smashes it to the ground absolutely oh uh, it's what do you think of the fire dragon um the fire dragon I thought was really interesting because obviously not knowing the kaiju canon I was like oh I've never heard of the fire yeah. dragon what oh, well, an interesting should, concept should introduce the fire dragon yeah introduce so the fire dragon w- once the monsters have kicked the absolute living shit out of King Ghidorah and the corpse is just lying there bloodied and ruined and whatever uh-huh. desecrated the uh, the Kelax launch another surprise attack from something they call the fire dragon it's sort of basically this blazing ball of flame mm-hmm. which scorches Rodan and just flies about and destroys a building in a nearby city yeah totally and, and then... it ruins the equipment of the um... of Monsterland yeah oh, well no uh, of Monsterland as well and of the the spaceship or our shuttle yeah well most importantly it destroys the monster control yes equipment so the monsters are no longer under human or Kilat control they're acting completely independently get to that later mm-hmm. but uh, so the fire dragon the, the the crew of the moonlight SY3 pursue the fire dragon and it turns out to just be a Kilak flying saucer probably the last one and they've sort of been at, at two earlier points in the film they pursue a flying saucer and it gets away both ah. times I like to think this is the same flying saucer and they finally get it <laughs> yeah the absolutely but um so the monsters are now acting of their own volition they're now completely independent of thought control mm-hmm. and uh the uh, the Kilak queen is sort of monologuing, saying, you know, "Oh, the fire dragon will destroy you all." And then you just hear Godzilla's roar, and in that sort of instant, her facade drops. She suddenly looks. She's been stoic and determined and smug through the whole film, but then when she hears Godzilla's bellowing roar, she just has a look of panic, like, "Oh my god, shit!" Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the plan's ruined. Yeah, and she kind of looks back as if, like, oh, oh, it's just so good. And then like. Godzilla blasts the Kilak dome with a few a few sparks of radioactive fire. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's not working. Oh well, I'll just do what we should have done at the fucking start. Charges it and just kicks it. Yeah, in. just bashes just it kicks in. Kicks the shit oh, out of Godzilla. it. And like of his own accord, Godzilla completely ends the Kilak invasion, and it's great. Absolutely. Like, there's that, that that great bit of dialogue. Um, oh, even if they're not under control, they'll still fight. The monsters know their enemy by natural instinct. Now the Kilax must pay. That's in the dub. That's great. It's so good. Um, uh, we were chatting bef- just before we started recording. We were talking about how funny it is that by the end, 
uh, when you know we sort of finally won up the Kelax and during that reaction scene where all is lost for our antagonist that there's still two monster land scientists <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's the you know a row full of the you know the, the beautiful silver aliens yeah. and then just two guys in orange jumpsuits <laughs> and when they're just as shocked that the plan hasn't worked it's like what are they getting out of this are but, they, I, I like to imagine they're, they're not even under my yeah. control they, were, they just decided you know what I'm going to stick with these guys. Yeah, they've just willingly switched sides. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> oh, totally. Um, so, yeah, what do you think of the finality of this film? Like, the sort of... It does feel final. Yeah, it, it certainly does feel final. And it ends on sort of essentially Monsterland having been re-established. Yeah. The monsters are back safe and waving and happy, yeah. it looks like, in... in their little enclosure it's nice because in the context of this film like we said earlier uh-huh. it was produced as a finale it obviously didn't turn out to be but let's look at it within its own context it was produced as a, as a finale and in this finale Godzilla and Minela get a nice happy ending yeah exactly they they are together they yeah. have a little island and all the monsters get a happy ending yeah, it seems, King yeah and the thing is is that the important thing is that all our monsters seem to have like formed an alliance like yeah. whereas our you know our early films were um, Godzilla versus Ang- Angela. Angulus. Uh, Angulus, thank you. Uh, Angela. Um, <laughs> someone should. Um, I want to see a list of every wrong name that I've called everything in this franchise. <laughs> it will not be very good. Um, but yeah, no, um, but now, again. 15 years on through these films or 45 years on in the in the context of the film mm. there there's harmony there's, there's harmony yeah, yeah. Um, and again yeah I think it's funny to read into it like a little bit of the element of like the morality of like enclosing creatures into zoos and stuff like that I think yeah. that's funny or not funny but like not haha funny <laughs> funny peculiar to think about it like that to read that into it um, like what they did to Mothra what they did to Mothra. <laughs> Mothra uh, did nothing wrong ever. Mothra did nothing wrong, <laughs> and this is how we repay. But no, I was really pleased for that uh, Godzilla Manila ending, especially yeah, considering nice. how upset I was at <laughs> the ending of Son of Godzilla. <laughs> like that was a tragedy for me, and this is a uh, you know a nice wholesome end to that yeah. arc. And I I do I like the Godzilla Manila pairing. Do I imagine that like some people sort of feel like. Godzilla's better on its own, mm. you know, solo, one on one kind of deal. It's nice. But I love Manila yeah. just tailing about, dropping things, not being very helpful. It's nice because it. <laughs> dropping things? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't drop. I it's don't like, think Manila did drop anything in this film, but like. Like Bilbo. Listen to that and tell me that you can't imagine like, it. Like Bilbo. Uh, what I pictured is Bilbo Baggins carrying all the swords and weapons in The Hobbit. <laughs> totally. <laughs> just. Uh. But um, it's nice because Minya gives. Godzilla something to fight for absolutely yeah and that literally in lieu of the two characters being together on screen and interacting it just tells you so much it just gives you so much character no, that agree, you wouldn't yeah. have if it was just Godzilla when it's Godzilla just walking somewhere that's you know because the thing is we've had Godzilla films that have very highly characterised Godzillas hmm. and Godzilla films that have very monstrous Godzillas and very just destruction 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 yeah putting manila with godzilla just always gives it this just lovely familial relationship yeah which no i, I agree. really enjoy I, agree. I like 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 i said to you last time you go through this sort of phase like oh I hate manila he's lame he ruins the franchise but no he's great he's, he's great just, i dig him and look, i think it's because if i was a kaiju i would be manila and <laughs> that's it if i was involved in that that is exactly how i would be <laughs> and little man machan is back playing Good. I'm very pleased. I, I would prefer not to see anyone else do it. <laughs> it's imagine. his role. It's his role. It's it like Orson Welles and Citizen Kane. Only Little Man <laughs> Machan can play Minola. Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to just look through my notes and see what else I've got. We have kind of sped through this one quite yeah, quickly. Yeah, we did quite well. I think we assumed this would be a longer one because we have more to discuss, but we've just we've spoke about but it, we've it made so it quickly. So punchy. It's been punchy. It's been a good listen, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, listeners, you got to, when you're listening to this one, you've got to go run. you got to do something really energetic. <laughs> you're do, do, clean your room really quickly. But 45 yeah. minutes is all you've got. <laughs> Time but is running out. I actually think... I, I've gotten through all my bullet points I made... Uh, while watching the film yeah so totally um, 
Very briefly, uh, this is not even a point. Okay. I just really loved how much, uh, how many shootouts there were in this film. Yeah. Especially the shootout in the monster base at the beginning of the film, yeah, yeah. where the astronauts discover uh, the attack and discover That's that great, the yeah. former scientists have been mind controlled. I, I like the one guy who gets shot in the forehead and does a sort of comedy reaction. He just kind of yeah, goes, just <laughs> he react, yeah, and, and yeah. that little red blood spot appears in his forehead. <laughs> but yeah, no, a lot of people getting shot in this film, which like, we yeah. have had before, if I'm right, have expressed. Yeah, there's been shootouts, yeah, there been shootouts. In, in, in the laboratory in Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster. That's right, and yeah. people have been shot and killed. But, but I, I like the shit. Never would, blood splatter. That's true. Before. Yeah, Idiot at Mariah was famously against uh, bloodshed. Yeah, that's right. And without well, ruining, I say that's right. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> without spoiling too much, now that he's no longer part of the series, that <laughs> changes. Bloody Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I like the shootout on the beach between the uh, Keylak controlled goons and the secret police. Yeah. Because like, the secret police just show up in their shitty brown suits yeah, and, with exactly. their, and with their pistols, whereas the uh, the, the, the goons that are under Keylak control are in sharp black suits. And, with ray uh, guns. They have ray guns that kind of make a noise like. And I love that sound effect. Mm-hmm. Also, also, just going back very briefly onto my discussion of like. I like imagining what this world of 1999 is like. Yeah. Heavily militarised, control of kaiju. Mm. And it rings true to what was going on with the Cold War. Uh, but it also, there's, you know, an element of, like, things that resonate today. Mm. How, you know, um, having control of our monsters and essentially using them like weapons. Yeah, like yeah. Like nuclear weapons. Yeah. Oh! oh! Topical! And yeah, using them against each other, etc. That way we should have an alarm for when things get topical. <laughs> uh, but no, I... Again, just thinking about like what... Um, imagining how this 1999 is, I like the idea that the UN has a cabal of secret police. <laughs> Again, they're everywhere. They're, they're watching. They're, they're apparently not so secret. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And they can barely find one hidden... Uh, Kalik. Yeah, Kalik agent. Yeah, Kilak. Kilak. Kadak. Pardon me, apologies to the Kilax. Um, <laughs> if, if any Kilax are listening, I am sorry. <laughs> Just when we're talking about that beach show, though, mm-hmm. one of my favourite other shots in the film is sort of we follow a alien controlled Kyoko walking along the beach in her heels uh-huh. and the heels just sort of dig into the sand and it's, just, it's very pleasing to yeah. me it looks, it's it's a nice sort of solid soft sort of crunch into the sand mm-hmm. and also another one of my favourite shots in the film also features Kyoko it's when um, she is she's just emerged from the Tokyo subway and she's been let go because she don't, they don't look for her earrings and she's just walking through the city and suddenly the alarms go mm-hmm. and Rodan starts attacking the yeah. city and from a dis- right. from a distance we see we, we're sort of looking down on a throng of people uh, running away and then suddenly Kyoko just enters the shot in the foreground and and uh, and uh, turns around to the camera and gives like a little smirk mm-hmm. and the acting of uh, the actress in that scene the actress uh, Yukiko Kobayashi is superb just in that sort of one turn and the look and the smirk there's so much yeah. conveyed and it reminds me very much of the scene in James Whale's Frankenstein when the monster first turns around and stares at the camera but um no because I was going to say I love that scene I really enjoyed yeah. that scene because again film for a film made in the 60s late 60s that's the fear isn't it that yeah. you're in your big city your wonderful metropolis and the alarms go off yeah. you're rushing into bunkers you're rushing into cities yeah. the trains are stopping what if you're on a train what are you supposed to do yeah. um, and then all while this is happening a sleeper agent a secret agent who has been plotting against you is walking past yeah, you exactly. and you would never have suspected it yeah. I really just love that parallel and that's why I keep and, making and it and the authorities don't pick her yeah, up yeah exactly yeah. They're, they're operating at a completely different level complete deception complete yeah. um, mystery that's totally. a lovely way to read this film Ross I like that I know thank you that's what you get dear listeners <laughs> see what you get with a fresh pair of eyes exactly um, well, actually when we started this podcast Stephen remember last week how I said that every other even numbered podcast we tend to have like a very well structured <laughs> straight to the point podcast and opening and then last week we had just a mess yeah. <laughs> just like a comedy mess I feel like we did quite well this week well see I, I was going to say the opposite I, I feel like this this 
episode has been like the podcast equivalent of all the monsters guy beating on King Ghidorah. Yeah, absolutely. It's just an absolute mess. Here's something else I noticed. Well, that's quite interesting that you would say that. I've also noticed this. <laughs> Um, and on that note on that note well let's just sort of sum up the films here let's just sum up kind of how how do you feel about this film Stephen I well I think this was the second Godzilla film I ever saw really really this was either the second or it was either a 1992 film called Godzilla vs Mothra but I can't remember specifically yeah which one I saw first either way it was very close proximity to each other but when I first saw this film I was disappointed right because this is seven year old Stephen uh, who's yeah, a, who's a it little, was it a bit he, too much for seven year old he, Stephen he's a little bitch at this point right? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have a proper film appreciation at this point but um, no I first saw the poster for this film in a book which was my first exposure to Godzilla a book called The Illustrated Dinosaur Movie Guide which is still it's in this flat right now uh-huh. and it's just beyond that wall I've seen it beyond the wall that <laughs> Stephen is pointing to and you the listeners can see um, I'm quite bad for that aren't I doing stuff that the listeners can't see you really are and then you just stop it. juggling Stephen this isn't film it's radio um, it's a different art form but uh, I first saw the poster for this film and the poster for this features all the monsters and glorious artwork all converging on one scene Uh and I was like oh my god I need to see this film this looks great Mm -hmm. and when I first saw it I was a bit disappointed because the monsters are sporadically through it and they're not all together in the same scene very much very often yeah just that once at the end when I first saw it I was kind of like oh oh, okay I like that but eh." but then as, as always I've watched it god knows how many times through the years Mm -hmm. and I I think it's a solid favourite now I think it's in my top ten um I find it slightly slow in the middle. Uh huh. Slightly. Having watched it again, yeah. yeah, I can argue. I mean, it, it's sometimes harder for me to tell if a movie, if I, I, I found bits entertaining or less entertaining the first time I watch a movie. Yeah. Because I'm just, you know, it's my first time seeing it, so it's all like it's all, yeah. entertaining. And then because that that happens to me all the time, like I'll like a movie very much, and then the second time I watch it, I go. Wow, that was boring. Yeah. How did I watch that? Never watch any of these again. I want your opinions to be untarnished. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Nah, but I mean, I'm joking. Yeah, it's very <laughs> like I really did like this movie. But like my my example of that is, for example, my example for that is, for example, that was very poorly structured sentence. Stephen, this is a professional. <laughs> <laughs> the scene where the uh, the the crew of the Moonlight SY three are preparing to set up their weapon to take down the Kelax control sphere. Uh-huh. We see them set it up at every stage. We see them pry open the box it's in we see them unscrew the weapon mm-hmm. we see them uh, uncoil the, uh, the the wire we see them going st- squad goals man I, I, they know I, what they're doing yeah I know the but I was just sitting watching it going we don't need to see this yeah no totally we <laughs> just like whipped it together but Destroy All Monsters it's a solid four star for me yeah no totally and as always I'll tell you how it's perceived within the fandom at large or at oh, least yes, in the western do. fandom I've I just come up with a very brief thing how interesting would it have been we were talking about the Kyoko thing earlier mm-hmm. would it have been if the earrings thing were a fake out and that you know the earrings are ripped off the mind control spell is broken but then later on surprise she's doing it of her own volition <laughs> uh, that'd be cool actually, that would yeah. be cool and then like she's still yeah like she actually just believes in their cause yeah <laughs> That would have been interesting. That would be an interesting dynamic, and it would, it would actually have... You're, you're, you're so right, actually. It would have given her something interesting to do in the finale. Yeah, exactly. But it would also... It would also... Um, continue Break. an unfortunate trend of uh, traitorous or mind-controlled women. Yeah, that's women. true. Because like, we have... You solve one problem, have, you start another. <laughs> Princess Salno in... That's right. In Ghidorah, the three-headed monster, who's only... Notable as a character when she's under spell, under, yeah, control. under control. Miss again. Namikawa in Invasion of Astro Monster, who's under control and is traitorous to an extent, and Kyoko in this. So I like the idea, Ross, but my god, man, you gotta think these things through! <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> but yeah, no, so. No, but uh, I like that. Yeah, I do no, like totally. that. That would have been excellent, yeah. That would have been cool. But right, so yeah, I. Summing up for me, um, I really did like this film. I love the heft of it. It is a beefy film. It is a lot. There's a lot going on in an hour and a half. Well, even I said to you in the first half an hour, I said to you, um, it's it's only watching this 
with a fresh set of eyes next to me do I realise just how loaded yeah. the first half an hour of this film is there's, there's so, so much, much information yeah. there's a lot of characters there's a lot of little subplots going on the amount of monsters we're given is pretty mm. intense the amount moon of times moon yeah, rockets the amount of times in this film we go back to the moon yeah we go to the moon and back over and over again we never found out the fate of that other moon base no we did not did hope... they just have their coffee and be annihilated yeah totally and just get blown up but you know something. I thought it was a great film really like hefty and like if it was the final Godzilla film it would have been a very very good end it'd be a hell of a finale it'd be very fitting as, as well. I always say I appreciate the variety of Godzilla films and here is our almost like big blockbuster one here is our war yeah. of the worlds here is our absolutely in, in our planetary yeah. war here well, is well I said to you when when the uh, the, the, the crew of the SY3 uh, break away and take the the Kilax control sphere I said to you that it's like they're just pranking them it's like they just yeah. you get it take it <laughs> intergalactic plan yeah this, this film was essentially a series of intergalactic pranks that have went too fucking far <laughs> But yeah, th- th- this film was generally in-, in the fandom. It's generally like a, like a solid favorite. Yeah. It's not, I don't think it's like top, top, top no, tier. No, no. But it's like it's high- it's more highly regarded than the last two films, and it's it's I think it's solidly. Like, I understand a that. No, because I just think it's it is a slightly different film. Normally, I'm less hot on the ones that ha- that lack that little bit of characterization. Yeah. But I still think that the element is still there. And in fact, it's probably a little bit more on the monsters. Totally, uh, totally, Godzilla totally. Godzilla and Manila, my beloveds. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so a great film I there was a lot of I had a lot of fun reading into it I had a lot of fun uh, taking it in I feel like design wise it's one of the best I've seen so far um, re- densely plotted which is fascinating to mm. watch um, looks so good it, probably one of the best looking Godzilla films so far I think oh it looks fabulous um, yeah. and I loved um, Godzilla vs. Ebera that was to me that so far those are my two this and Godzilla vs. Ebera are my uh, two favourite visually. Uh, nice, and nice, nice. probably two of my favourites yeah. so far. I really like this one. Nice. Um, Good. Yeah, certainly. So, to wrap up, my opinion, surprise, <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> well, it's funny because you said that this, you're talking about the uh, the uh, variety and tone and scale and stories this sort of, this series tells. Uh, the next film that we'll watch is a significant departure from this film in almost every respect. You know me, I do love a significant departure. <laughs> um, but before we get to that, we'll just will we read out some of our listener submissions. Yeah, for absolutely, the totally. We did mention in the last one, guys, that we, we were we, don't get us wrong. We're honestly so pleased that we're getting more and more submissions, but. The, the episode yeah. lengths were getting a bit longer, and we found we got time to keep. We found ourselves having to cut short our own comments to accommodate those of listeners, yeah. and not to sound like a pair of dickheads, basically. But it's yeah, you know, it's, it's understandable though. Just so, just keep it short, guys. Yeah. And we'll try and read out as many as we can. Probably won't read out every single one that we get from now on, but yeah, we will but, try and just make sure that we, um, if we've never heard of you before, you'll yeah, get read. And out. they'll certainly be up on the blog, regardless. Exactly. Um, so we just have two submissions this this episode because I didn't I didn't send out a call for submissions. I just let people submit them on of their own accord. So uh, our first submission is from uh, a good friend of Kaijusaurus, both blog and podcast. It's from. Daphne. Daphne says, Hi Ross, hi Stephen. Hi Daphne! <laughs> wow, what can I say about Destroyer Monsters? First off, congratulations to Ross. Your congratulations to Ross are in order. I fucked that one up, didn't I? Mm-hmm. You've seen my very favourite Godzilla movie. I'd bore you both with the story of how I made it to my quest to track down this movie as a child, but I know we're supposed to keep our comments short. Nice, nice. Nice, appreciated. Taking it on board. Mm hmm. So instead, I'll say I absolutely love this movie. It's got all my favourite Godzilla. But oh God, I'm just trying to rattle through these. I just need to take, take my your time, time with it. Don't worry, <laughs> it's all good. Sorry, Dad. We're all friends here. <laughs> it's got all my favourite things about Godzilla films: lots of kaiju, aliens with fun costumes, 
female characters who actually contribute to the plot, and a Godzilla who, if not outright heroic, is at least neutral and not considered a mindless antagonist. Mm -hmm. The Showa Godzilla has always been my favourite. Agreed. I can't help it, I'm a sentimental gal, and I like Godzilla the most when he's one of the good guys. If I'm honest, my only major complaint about this film is how Godzilla himself is handled. He spends so much of the film under Keylak mind control, and as a child I was outraged that he could be bossed around so easily. Nowadays, when I watch the film, I watch the mind control scenes with barely contained glee, knowing that when Godzilla is in his right mind again, he's going to be furious. It's basically, just you wait until your father gets home, <laughs> then you'll be sorry. Absolutely. On a kaiju-sized scale. Um, no, because I was going to say, yeah, no, I find I found when Godzilla was solidly under mind control, I, it's a little bit disconcerting. Yeah. It's worrying. You're like, oh no. Yeah. What's he going to do? Um, but you kind of no. know. But yeah, you know. He's... Like, Godzilla's going to kick your fucking ass Absolutely. when it comes to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Daphne continues, despite this movie's occasional moments of implausibility, still waiting for that Earth to Moon rocket system we were supposed to get in 99. We're getting it. The movie holds not with NASA in the state they're in now. This movie holds up. <laughs> <laughs> this movie holds up surprisingly well, as you both are no doubt aware. No, well, I'm not. I was aware, <laughs> but not. I mean, look at Ross. He's, I had to explain. You can't it. look at me. Earlier. We've explained it's radio. I'll post a picture of you. As you both are no doubt aware, Gorosaurus had to sub for Baragon when the latter suffered an onset injury, no doubt to Rodan's drunken shenanigans behind the scenes. And most women actually are aliens with aims to colonize Earth and create a scientific utopia. You have to appreciate a movie that's dedicated to scientific accuracy and incorporates nods to the behind the scenes action of the film by giving Baragon his due credit, even when it was Gorosaurus who had to step in to film his scenes. The Stroyal Monsters is a fun movie, though there are some moments where the plot gets a little slow. I agree, I, mm -hmm. I said that about five minutes ago. Ifukubi, I'm accusing this submission that I got a month ago of ripping me <laughs> ripping off. off. Ifukubi's soundtrack full of lingering spookiness and Moody late motifs. Late motifs. I'm not a music man. Carries the film when the action doesn't. And of course I've got nothing but rabid fangirl shrieking to offer when it comes to the kaiju brawl at the end of the film. So good. I'm sure other people, people other than myself, can offer more nuanced critiques towards the film's cinematic merits. And there are other Godzilla films I can be more objective about and do the same. But when it comes to destroyer monsters, I just can't help myself. This movie is too dear to my heart. When I watch Destroy All Monsters, all is right with the world, and even my mind-controlled earrings don't bother me. <laughs> Daphne. Thank you, Daphne. There's a lot of great stuff in there. Yeah, like, I, totally. I agree with practically all of that. And I agree that it's like a fun movie, and that like normally a few of the things that I would be a little bit critical of in earlier Godzilla films, I don't mind so much, because it's a really well-done movie. Mm. It is designed just to be like bombastic, yeah. fun, a... a fantastic mess and I think it was great to watch I really enjoyed watching it I agree yeah totally uh, our next Thanks, submission Daphne. our next submission comes from Hamish Steele oh. Hamish um, is the person who created the Kaijusaurus blog yes uh, he handed it over to me in February of 2013 I believe Um and you turned it into the Kaijusaurus media <laughs> empire it is today so uh, <laughs> so um yeah, this, uh, thank you, Hamish. Cool. Is, we, technically, we this is all thanks to you. Thank ha you, Hamish, Hamish as well. Ha Hamish is also the illustrator and animator behind uh, Cartoon Hangover's short Dead End, the webcomic Dead Endia, and uh, the Nickelodeon short Urchin. Ooh. And uh, he's a very fine and talented animator and illustrator. Cool. And so I'll yeah, give me a, a, look. a few links yeah, in there as well. It. So this is from Hamish. Ross, do you want to take this one? Yeah, or cool. Just a little short one. So Destroy All Monsters from Hamish. This, as a kid, was my ultimate favourite Godzilla film, and it's easy to see why. It's the Avengers of Kaiju films. Totally, it is. <laughs> as, a, as a kid, I was fascinated by the quick glimpses of Baragon and Varan. Varan. Why not? Whatever. And the strangely prominent roles of Gorosaurus and Manda. Not knowing where these monsters came from, they felt like some real world building. And I would agree with that. Yeah, because I, agree. I don't really have the connection. They're just there. There are more <laughs> there are more kaiju in the world yeah. than each film shows yeah. suggests. And it's fun because it sort of retroactively puts their individual films into the Godzilla canon. Yeah, in, in ways. In, in ways, ways yeah. yeah. Monster Island is one of the most significant inventions in kaiju cinema and the Kilaks are definitely my favourite Toho <laughs> alien race. What changed when I grew up 
and watched it as an adult was I realised just how beautifully directed these films are. I love the subtle retro futurisms of the far off year of 1999. I love the almost Wes Anderson way the interior spaceship scenes are filmed. Totally, I'll it, pass. It is a bit Steve Zissou. Yeah, no, it really is. Uh, as Hamish says, it's the pastel yellow and symmetry. And then the scene leading up to the jumping out of the window is really well shot as well. Oh yeah, that's yeah, great. No, when when, um, Doctor... when Yoshio Suchio's character is forced to commit suicide. Yeah. Yeah, um... Oh yeah, that's great because Akira Kubo and Jun Tazaki's heads are sort of framed through uh, circular patterns in the sort of uh, girding of the. That's right, and there's a you know they're they're both in wee circles. They yeah, can't yeah. see the whole picture yet. They're trying to talk. They're trying yeah. to get this guy to explain what's going on. And they that, don't know what's going yeah, on. Yeah, and then there's that great scene where they look down on his body, and they're both sort of really well framed in the camera, and they're looking down at the camera. And it's like, mm-hmm. oh, that's a really well. It's I great. agree with Hamish. Yeah, I, no, I actually, absolutely. Hamish posted this a little while ago, just saying sort of that, and I. Uh, that's what made me realise how like, well shot light. that scene. <laughs> <laughs> like heart, how well shot in particular that scene. Yeah, is. no, it was a very well shot movie. Obviously, a sheer Honda back in the chair. Um, so yeah, thanks for the submissions, guys. Thank um, you, Hamish and Daff. We'll hear more from you in the next one. Um, Ross, I believe you have a shout out. Well, yeah, I've got a few few wee different things. So first of all, uh, as we've already seen on the Kaijusaurus Facebook page, (laughs) last week I talked very heartily about uh, Lost, and I know Daphne especially was very proud of me for um, (laughs) being a Lost fan. Lost fans unite we have to look out for each other um, but yeah no, so one of our listeners uh, Redem10 sent us like a really cool uh, photoshop that's just a, a Godzilla Manila and Lost crossover <laughs> which I love a lot um, so yeah if you want to go see that go on the Kaijusaurus podcast Facebook page link in the show notes link in the show notes and then the other thing um, was that we got sent from the people over at insanecomics.com uh, they wanted us to have a wee read uh, before it's out of their uh, comic Night of the Fire Beast Mm -hmm. so um, it was drawn by Christopher uh, Martinez and it was scripted by Jonathan Crode uh, or Claude pardon me sorry Jonathan Uh, and they share the story credit together and I had a wee read of it and I really liked it Um, essentially it's a comic book adaptation of a fictional uh, kaiju movie that doesn't actually exist and it's really cool so if you want to check that out head over to insanecomics.com there'll be a link to that in the show notes also yes um, I, I wipe my hands <laughs> I also have an announcement announce um, I will officially be returning to G-Fest this year woo <laughs> I didn't know that I didn't know that congratulations <laughs> I, uh, I booked it two days ago and um, I'm very much hoping to bring along the mic and do a little G-Fest podcast special Mm -hmm. so um, I mean if anyone wants to hang out and say hi or just be on the podcast if you want to be me (laughs) will I be going Ross? maybe not probably not but who knows these things could happen so um, yeah say hi to me at G-Fest I'll probably be wearing a Dr. Surizawa outfit at least one of the days Uh uh-huh um don't be shy don't be shy don't be a stranger and I will hopefully see many of you at G-Fest in Chicago wonderful US good announcement Uh, okay so very quickly before we wrap up tell me what I'm seeing next you're seeing next um, the first film post Eiji Tsuburaya's death Mm -hmm. Um, I've said earlier it's a huge departure from Destroy All Monsters in almost every way in scale and tone Um. And even the film's title doesn't really let you know what you're in for. <laughs> right, cool. Like I'm excited. Giggling. I'm loving uh, it. The next film goes by many names. <laughs> in the US, it was known as Godzilla's Revenge. Uh-huh. It's really not an apt title for the film. Totally not. Toho's international title is All Monsters Attack. Again, it is not a good title for the film. It doesn't no. really make sense. The Japanese title is Urul Kaiju Daishin Geki or All Monsters on Parade. Sound I am but pleased. I most commonly refer to it as Godzilla's Revenge just because that's the fil- that title I know it by, even though it doesn't really fit at all. Totally. So Godzilla's Revenge slash All Monsters Attack is next, and um there's no way to adequately describe this film. 
that is the perfect <laughs> review you can give it. I am very, I am very much looking forward to that. I'll tell you all how I feel next time we do this. So thank you all as always. You can find us as always on kaijusaurus.tumblr.com, the blog from which this podcast is spun Spawned. off. We, we are on iTunes, the Kaijusaurus podcast. Leave us a rating and a review if you're feeling generous. Um, we are on Facebook. There'll be a link to that in the show notes. A link to all our social media in the show notes. We're both on Twitter. Um, links in the show notes as always sound um, very professional podcast let's shake hands very good we are shaking hands We're now shaking hands. I'm pleased with what we did um, thanks for listening guys as always we really appreciate it um, and we really love your questions your comments and all the weird photoshops and comics <laughs> that you send us keep them coming keep them coming please thanks everyone see you at G-Fest hopefully bye bye bye